as a female athlete, did you face any obstacles that the male athletes didn't? Um, I think inherently, like being a female athlete, there, especially in like a sport like soccer, which is predominantly male dominated around the world, I think in general, just dealing with sort of the disrespect that comes with being a female athlete and people not really thinking that what you're doing is legitimate is probably how I would say I've most dealt with it. Um, both my parents were athletes at like a D1 level. So I never felt really out of place being a female athlete, but I do think that there was more of this societal judgment that comes with being a female soccer player. Um, you know, people <laughs> people always thinking that they can like beat you in a one-on-one -on -one just because they're a guy or um, I've had a lot of people who I would like date who would be like, yeah, I can, I can beat you in soccer. Um, I think just because I'm a woman. <laughs> um but i would say you know like directly i i didn't face too much outright discrimination for being a female player i attended a club that was well funded for young girls and ucla did a pretty good job about advertising our program it was one of the top in the country so maybe that had something to do with it but um, i always felt very supported by my network in terms of being that's awesome. I, you know, we, we need to hold each other up a little bit more, especially when we're faced with stuff like that. Like, the yeah. men just seem to want to think. I'm not as much into sports, but I'm definitely like in the gym a lot. Yeah. And, and I like to watch all the like the ego lifting, and then I'm like, oh, I'm gonna cap your size, and I'm gonna lift that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, there's. I definitely think that like a lot of men will inherently like think that they're better than you, or like I have dudes all the time who when I'm just like casually dating and stuff who will like try and one up me and I'm like I don't know what you're trying to prove here I was a professional athlete <laughs> like, <laughs> nine times out of ten I'm gonna beat you at anything you do so yeah. um I would say that's literally the only sort of discrimination I would face yeah in sport. so while at UCLA you decided to join a movement by taking a knee during the national anthem in fact you were like one of the first college athletes to do so did you find that you were supported by UCLA and your teammates? Um, yeah, definitely, which I think is, especially seeing what's like happening at UCLA right now with their gymnastics team, um, is very surprising to me. I received a lot of support, not only from my coaching staff, Amanda and Sam, and the rest of the staff, but also from the administration. Um, I think, you know, doing so public the protest was sort of a risk, and they made it very clear while I was at UCLA that my protest was supported and that, you know, I would have all the resources that I needed in order to, like, feel supported, which I think is or was and is a really unique experience, not only in college sports, but in um, all sports. I feel like, you know, especially in recent years, it's become very apparent that people would rather just have athletes shut up and dribble and kind of stay out of politics and stay out of things that are more relevant to current affairs. But I felt very supported at UCLA. And uh, I think that has a big, I feel like that has played a big part in why my activism has continued to grow because the, the, one of the first times that I actually, you know, did something as an activist, I was supported. Um, whereas if, you know, I, I would have tried to do feeling and I wasn't supported I feel like I would have not necessarily backed off but it would have been a lot harder to continue pushing in the activist space. That's understandable. With everything that's happening with UCLA and the gymnastics team now how do you feel about that change in the dynamic since you were a student? I mean it's disappointing um because you just like based on my own experience I feel privileged that I had the opportunity to protest in that way and that I was supported, especially because some of the same, you know, characters who are showing me support are now not supporting the black athletes that are there now. And it feels really it feels like a sense of like cognitive dissonance. Um, it's really upsetting and I think that's why I'm being very, very vocal about, you know, supporting the gymnastics team and the black women on the team just because 
because I know that UCLA can do better, and I know that they are able to give the support that they gave to me. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of strange to see, but um, I think that it was still very novel when I decided to kneel in college, and maybe that had something to do with it, the PR of it. You know, you don't want to be the college that is telling the, the black student that she can't protest police brutality publicly. But I almost feel as if now that um, sort of activism or sports activism is more mainstream after George Floyd and after all the protests that happened, um, universities are less inclined to be very outwardly supportive as they were, like when it was still a novel thing, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I have a lot of feelings on it. It's it's just it, it's very disappointing to see that they're not supporting the women who are there now the same way. Yeah. It's just disappointing on multiple levels. You've got a race level, you've got a gender level. Like, yeah. There's so many things involved in that. You're just like, come on now, really? Yeah. Let, let's step it up, people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, if you're comfortable, can you give an example of a life experience that led you to pursue activism? Um, I mean, like, <laughs> my life experience is being Black. Um, I recognize that I have a lot of privilege in being light-skinned and being biracial. Um, but seeing and hearing the stories of, of what my family has gone through, my, my dad is from Georgia, my grandma is from Georgia and the deep south and grew up in the time of like the civil rights era or was born in the time of the civil rights era so you know we're not that far off from some of the horrors of Jim Crow and some of the remnants of slavery and so you know I've I've grown up hearing stories about how my family members outwardly and um, inwardly like experience a lot of racism um i myself you know i've been told to go back to africa i've had my fair share of uh, racial incidents so i think my activism genuinely you know came out of me fearing for my community and wanting to make an impact in my community being a black woman in america it's really hard to kind of escape your fate as a black person in america it's hard to separate the experience of being black from anything you do in life. And I think my activism initially started as a direct protest to police brutality that we were seeing, um, you know, after Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, um, all those horrible police shootings. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, no, it definitely did. Um, how do you find balance in your activism work between gender and racial inequalities? Or do you find that there's a place where they coexist? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I'm an intersectional pro-Black feminist. Um, <laughs> I feel like you can't really have liberation for the Black community without the liberation of women, and you can't have liberation for women without the liberation of the Black community. And I think if more people thought more intersectionally, they wouldn't be in the mess that is America right now. Um, but one of the things that always inspires me is like, well, it's, it's not inspiring, it's kind of scary, but like MLK was assassinated once he started rallying support between the black community and the working class, like white poor. And I think that goes to show how powerful solidarity is. And so I definitely think that there's a space for um, working on gender equality, equality for black Americans. I think they coexist and I think they need to be brought together. And uh, I think, you know, being a black American is an experience and be being a woman in America is an experience and being a black woman and having that intersection of my own identity has um, sort of exposed me to a, <laughs> a unique intersection of the American experience. <laughs> Um, in terms of being oppressed, and I think that you know, we're not gonna have true freedom for anybody if you're just working on one issue instead of keeping the issues addressed together. Yeah, I get that. 
Um, during your time playing for the Washington Spirit, you faced verbal abuse and racism from your coach, Richie Burke. How has that further shaped your desire to speak up against racial injustice? Um, I think, like, with that particular experience, not that I hadn't experienced microaggressions throughout my life, because I definitely did, but I think that experience exposed me exposed me to the way in which microaggressions can be very very harmful and I think I maybe didn't necessarily realize the impact that they had on me throughout my life until that moment in time just because I think the environment of like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and just like all the racial unrest in 2020 really sort of opened my eyes to how harmful microaggression was and how insidious small acts of racism can be like it did I realized it didn't have to be the overt sort of like calling somebody the n-word or like using a racial slur in order for it to be very very harmful and I think having that lens to continue doing work in the racial justice space um, was really helpful to me just because it changed my perspective not that, again, not that I didn't know it, but it's a different thing to, you know, think of something in a theoretical sense and to also experience it and be gaslit by it and told that you're making a big deal out of nothing. And, um, so I think it just sort of changed my perspective and gave me a new lens to look at the work that I was doing too. And again, any time that I feel like I've been harmed or wronged, it just sort of puts fuel into my fire to continue making change so that other people don't have to feel something similarly. And so I think it was, again, like more fuel in my fire to pursue the work that I was doing. Uh, I mean, that's completely understandable. Um, so currently you're the chair of the Anti-Racist Soccer Club, which is a huge accomplishment. And you're also a project manager for Common Goal for the Anti-Racist Project. Do you feel that you offer a unique perspective to the table as a female and as an activist? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think everybody who might be doing the work that I'm doing has a unique perspective, but I think honestly what makes my perspective unique is just like having lived through the system that I'm trying to change. I think a lot of people who operate in the soccer space, especially at like the upper management level, have no idea how it feels to like go through the system so i'd say my 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 lens is more unique through that experience um again going back to i guess like the intersectionality of it i think being a black female offers a very unique lens in america in general especially when confronting issues of racism because i feel like you're able to see more aspects of how racism can permeate how it can be harmful to particular communities. Um, so hopefully that's a unique lens that I'm bringing. But yeah, I feel like especially in doing racial justice work in the soccer space, actually having lived through the system that you're trying to change is pivotal in trying to make an impact because um, I'm not just some third party actor who is trying to change the system they, they know about but not know completely about it. Yeah. And it makes sense like how can you change something that you really truly don't understand? And like understand yeah. it, you've had to experience some of it to an extent. Yeah, I feel like again this could, kind of goes back into the like theoretical knowledge versus lived experience. And so yeah. the lived experience that I have definitely changes my perspective. It's understandable. Do you have any goals you want to achieve in your activism? Oh, I want to end racism, <laughs> but uh, less lofty. I don't know. I just want to, I want to leave the world a better place than I found it in. And, you know, that could, I don't know exactly what that could look like. I, I feel like I've already made a pretty big wave in the soccer space, which makes me feel good. Um, I guess my goal for activism is just to try and push for change as hard as I can for as long as I can. And I know that sounds like very generic and cliche, but um, specific goals, that's, it's just hard to, it's hard to quantify because there's so much that needs fixing in our society. 
especially in American society, and I'm learning especially in, like, American soccer society. <laughs> so it's hard to quantify, but as long as I am continually pushing for change and continually making an impact where I can with the resources I have and with my capacity, um, I'll feel good about, you know, operating in that type of space. I mean, that's a great goal that you can't really – something so widespread to have such a small like focus goal yeah. I feel like you're missing out the opportunity to build on anything else yeah um, it's uh it's, it's hard to quantify like even in applying for law school uh they they're asking they're like some of the questions for applications would be like you know what are your ultimate goals and I really don't have one particular because there are so many things that I, I, I hope to impact one day but I hope that as I continue operating in this space that it becomes clear over time. <laughs> oh, it definitely will, especially as you like dig deep into things and you're able to get a hold of different resources, it, it'll open up more retrospective stuff. I'm hoping, I'm hoping. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you mentioned you know, the different space in soccer in America. How did that differ during your time in Germany? Uh, my experience in Germany, like, I genuinely have not talked about my experience in Germany a lot, like, publicly. Um, I don't know, like, I was, when I went to Germany, it was because I was, one, like, fleeing a really bad situation, obviously, with the Washington Spirit, like, I wanted to get out of there, and I, I could not imagine having to be there for any longer than I was. Um, I think, I think there was, like, a month left in when we were reporting and I just I literally could not imagine myself lasting for another month and so that's sort of the context of me going to Germany and then I got there and I was in a foreign country and didn't speak the language and luckily had a another American friend there but the the club was not what I expected um it was like a division two and the quality wasn't what I expected and like the coaching was not there and the resources were not there. Um, and so I think I was, I, w I was in crisis mode, quite frankly. So I, I didn't have a lot of time to, to actually think about, like I didn't have internet for a month when I was there. So I was just, I really didn't have too much time to like think about um, everything that was happening back in the States, which might've been a good thing just for the sake of like my sanity. But, um, I don't know, when I was in Germany, it gave me a lot of alone time and being so isolated, it really had me searching for community. And I was I was trying to figure out ways that I could still make a difference, like even though I was across the world. And that's when I started my book club, which I think was really cool. Um, and that was a really awesome thing for me to do. I love to read, which is one of my passions and also learn through reading and to talk to other people who were similarly interested in doing like anti-racism work. Um, so, um, I don't know. I, I don't exactly know how to answer that question, but Germany was just a very unique time for me where I sort of was figuring out if I still wanted to play soccer. And I wouldn't say that I was actually processing a lot of the trauma that had happened to me in the Mediceville yet, but it definitely was sort of an escapist uh, period in my life and you know it pretty much solidified for me that I wanted to start applying for law school and that that was something I wanted to do and it, again like I fostered a sense of community with my book club so it really was like a good foundational transition period and I think that going to Germany definitely fueled my direction and my vision for where I am now so even though I had like kind of a bad experience there I wouldn't change it because it put me so those, those weird experiences that kind of shape us and allow us to, to find that that niche that's ours, really. Because yeah. you have that time to look yeah. in. And... <laughs> I literally was, like, so isolated, so alone. I definitely got depressed while I was in Germany. But I came on the other side, like, having a very, very, very clear vision about what I wanted to do and who I wanted to be. So. It's good, though, that you're able to turn that, that experience. <laughs> it's perfect. Yeah, I wish more people understood that that's what those mo moments are for and it's not for you to just sink that yeah. you can use them yeah eventually you can use them after yeah. you get out of the sinking 
Yeah. Eventually you, you don't sink anymore. I promise. Yeah. All right, I got one last question. What advice do you have for young female athletes facing adversity in the world? Um, gosh, so much advice. I wish that I could tell my younger self a lot of things, but I don't know, especially like for young black female athletes, but all female athletes, young female athletes in general, like the, the cards are stacked against us. That's how the system was designed. And it's up to us to try and tear it down. Um, so I would just say like, completely standing in your power and knowing what you bring to the table at all times and not settling for what has been put in front of us is the best advice that I can give. Like you do not have to be satisfied existing in a system that was designed to tear you down. You can work against it. And there are people who are working with you to try and do the very same thing. And I feel like especially being a female athlete, it can feel very isolating and at times it can be very discouraging. You know, there's a lot of weird like sexual abuse in youth sports. There's um, men who go on weird power trips as coaches and as administrators and owners. And, you know, there's a myriad of issues that you're going to face as a young female athlete, but there is so much power in even you know, this just existing in the space. Like, even if you're not, like, the top of your team, you're not the top of the league, or you're not some superstar, like, being a female athlete in and of itself is, I think, a very, very powerful thing. Um, because you're existing in a space despite it trying to tear you down. So I would just, I guess the advice more succinctly is just stand in your power and recognize that you know what you're doing is revolutionary and eventually we're going to get to a place where it's going to be better for the people after us so we just need to keep grinding it out and you know standing in our power 